Operating Officer and Practicing Gynecologist at Visions Healthcare. We're located in Dedham and in Wellesley. And I just want to say up front, A, I tend to talk fast, so if I talk too fast, please let me know. Just sort of flag me down. And also, I am mom to four wonderful children who are extremely generous and in back-to-school season typically share with me their coughs and sundry other things. So I'm sorry in advance if I cough. I will turn my head away from the microphone. So Visions Healthcare is the company I work at. We are a multi-specialty, <coughs> integrative group. All the docs are board certified. And we have two locations. So uh, if you find that you want to ask a question but not in the group, we do have a booth. And you can visit the booth to talk to some of our docs who are at the booth today. And um, otherwise, I'm happy to answer questions. But the disclaimer is that this is not a medical visit. So I'm going to refrain from saying, you should take this or you should do that largely because this really needs a trained professional. So I'm doing a broad brush overview of what goes on into How to Feel Amazing. I brought my fan club. They're in the back of the room. So if you hear anybody, I brought some of my kids to cheer me on today. Just in case. In case it was like everybody was bored, we brought the four-year-old to cheer. <laughs> I graduated from Tufts Medical School in the year of 2000 and then started a OBGYN residency, which is a four-year process. I spent, once I graduated from that, I spent almost five years working as a staff OBGYN in which I delivered babies, did surgery, did office care for women, and two years in I was diagnosed with celiac disease. And that really probably was the thing that helped me start to work at Visions Healthcare because what we do at Visions is all about feeling amazing on a daily basis. And I didn't feel amazing on a daily basis, so I left my job and came to work at Visions. I come from a long line of celiacs. I'm a proud celiac pedigree human being. <coughs> my dad has celiac disease. I believe that my grandmother had celiac, although I have to say she flatly refused to be tested, but she had all of the signs and symptoms. My brothers both have celiac. My cousins are all sensitive to gluten, although they haven't been formally tested. And all of our children, via my pedigree, because I carry both the DQ2 and the DQ8 gene, have inherited one gene from me, so I've already promised them to pay for their therapy because I've given them such terrible genes. But when I was diagnosed at 35, it really led me on a quest to feel good because I had been sick for 20 years before diagnosis and really never thought about how I could feel because how I felt was simply how I felt. And I think that's what's really amazing in how we are, is we don't say, I don't feel like that person, we feel how we feel. So what we're going to talk about are what I'll call the influencing factors. This is the appetizer, and then in about 15 minutes we'll get to the main course, which are the seven ways to really start to feel good. We're going to talk about the rain barrel theory, your gut health, your body type, and genetics, and genetics include whether you carry the DQ2 or DQ8, or both in my case, whether you have a methyl tetrahydrofolate reductase genetic mutation. So we're going to talk about these things. Let's talk about the rain barrel. I live in Newton, and they're actually not allowed to have rain barrels. They're, they're, they weren't allowed to collect the gray water when we, when we uh, moved into our house. But they're really great, and what it looks at is that you are completely unique. You're different from the person next to you. You're different from your family members. <coughs> Every person is born with a particular constitution. And what I mean by that, and we're going to talk more about constitution, but what I mean by that is you're born with an innate ability to take and deal with what you can deal with. And that means that you deal with things differently than the person next to you and your sister. You know, the question I get in the office a lot is, why me? How come I have these problems and my sister, brother, husband, child, family member don't? And it's really because your body, as it fills with stressors, then starts to manifest symptoms. And every person's set point is different. So your rain barrel might be the size of a thimble, and your rain barrel might be the size of the thing on Route 93. Everybody's different. As we age, we get less able to process stressors. So what you could deal with no problem when you're 20, like a, a hard night partying, you can't deal with as well when you're 40. And those stressors start to fill the rain barrel. 
And as I mentioned, when it's over full, that's when you get symptoms. And those symptoms can run the gamut of everything. We're going to focus on gut health today, but it's really all comers. All symptoms are signs of a full rain barrel. <coughs> We're also going to talk about ways to decrease stressors. <coughs> but, you know, the rain barrel I saw had a little spigot at the bottom, and I thought, oh, how cool if we had a spigot. You know, we start to get full and we just empty it out. But we're not like that. It takes a little more in-depth work to quiet and empty our rain barrels. So when I was preparing for this talk, I found this awesome slide online. And, you know, if you asked me, I'm into symmetry, I'm into neatness, I would have said that this one on the right was exactly how we should look inside, because it's kind of neat. And the one on the left would not be good, because it's very messy, except my thought process is wrong completely. And the one on the left is a healthy intestinal lining. What happens in the lining of your gut is there's all of these cells that are exposed to the food coming by. And the goal of that food, I'm sorry, the goal of those cells is to absorb your food, your nutrients, your minerals, get you what you need. And the more surface area you have, the more absorption that's occurring. Now just so I know, how many people in the audience are gluten free? <coughs> Oh my goodness gracious, that's a lot of people. All right then. So, for people who had celiac disease or have celiac disease, this is what the lining looks like before diagnosis. It's flat. You know, I know a lot of people who have celiac disease have trouble having the right levels of vitamin B, vitamin D, iron. It's because your body's not absorbing, because it doesn't have the surface area, and the surface area that's left is damaged to boot. It's a really bad combination. So in our house, hungry and tired is a bad combination. This and food is a bad combination. You're not absorbing what you need. The next portion of the slide looks at nitty gritty what happens in the lining of your, of your gut. Now, what's really cool is the, and creepy too is the lining of your gut is made up of one cell thickness. That means that there's one cell that stands between you and complete mayhem. And should you damage the lining of your gut, you're going to allow particles, toxins, fungi, Lots of things to get in that shouldn't. Now what's really interesting on top of that is this, these cells are stuck together. They're, they're like glued up. And people who are sensitive to gluten over secrete something called zonulins. I don't know, has anyone here has heard of zonulins? A couple. It was discovered in the, in the University of Maryland in 2000 by a man named Alessio Fasano. The guy is brilliant. And what he found is people who are sensitive to gluten secrete more of these zonulins, and zonulin acts like acetone on the glue that's holding our cells together. So people like me, and some of you, if you had gluten, you upregulate zonulins, meaning you make more of, and then these cells get separated. And that's what you have here, is the lining of the gut that's allowing toxins and parasites and yeast and fungi and food particles, like the gluten particle, into your bloodstream, where your bloodstream says, this is an enemy, this is a foe, I don't know what that is, and mounts an immune response. This is the origin of the autoimmune component <coughs> of celiac disease, as well as other diseases. All right, lots of women who say to them, what's your body tape? They say, I'm an apple, or I'm a pear. <laughs> we're not going to be talking about that. What we're going to talk about is your innate constitution. So I have a girlfriend. Her name's Adriana. I worked with her at uh, my staff OBGYN position. And the woman could take anything. 36 hours into call, her hands would be steady, her brain is clear, she's calm. She'd go home and exercise that night after 36 hours working. <coughs> Me, 36 hours later, I'm a raving lunatic. I cannot form a coherent thought. My brain is dead and my hands are shaking. So first body type I call, I, she's strong like bull. She can take anything. You know, throw it at her and she'll just keep going. She'll go do some yoga afterwards. Then there's me. <laughs> Strong like mouse. <coughs> so when you're, the, the trick in life is to know yourself. It's really, I really in my heart believed I was strong like bull. So I went to one of the hardest residencies. OBGYN's hard. Babies mm -hmm. misbehave inside and outside. But inside is when I'm responsible for them. And it's, it's a really challenging thing to do. So by the end of residency, I was a mess, because I thought that I was strong like bull. So the trick is to really know your body type and know what you can take, because you could be somewhere in the middle, but the, tr the, the, the gold is to make the right choice for what works in your body. So if you're someone who's strong like mouse, you should not be working a night job. 
You shouldn't. It's not good for you. It'll harm you. So there's a lot of influencing factors that help how we deal with stressors. Your body is unique. You're not the same as the person next to you. you one size does not fit all in treatment. Your innate constitution has to deal with how you deal with stressors. The stressors themselves, how hard were they? You know, I know people who grew up in an incredibly toxic family life. That's a huge stressor for some people. Did you move around a lot as a child? Were you teased? These are childhood issues, but then you move into adolescence, which one could argue is just sort of a stressful event, a whole four years. And also how you process them. What did you eat? What are you eating? Do you exercise enough? Do you get enough sleep? Studies show that we sleep one to two hours less than our ancestors did. And I think they probably had it right because our bodies need to rejuvenate and need to rest. <coughs> Not sleeping enough really harms our body's ability to heal. What's your emotional balance? Just who are you and how do you dance with what comes at you? What are your genetics? Methyl tetrahydrofolate reductase raises your risk if you're a single or double carrier. It raises your risk for almost every disease. So knowing that about yourself might influence the choices you make in terms of your food, your activity, your sleep, your lifestyle. Anyone here seen The Wizard of Oz? I just think of that as a completely idyllic lifestyle. You know, she rode her bike, she, she had an easy life except for her family members who might be a little stressful, and the tornado was kind of a not so good. But our lives are extremely different. Anyone here have stress? <laughs> Not just me. We have high stress, and it takes the form of lots of different things. Your boss, your deadlines, simply managing a household these days. I know we go to three different stores in order to have enough food. You know, we have four kids, so they eat a lot. They like to eat every day. So, <laughs> so even managing getting to the three stores can be stressful. A lot of women in the audience. Most women I know hold two jobs, in and out of the home. I'm neither promoting or, I'm not saying whether it was good or bad, but the 1950s had a particular benefit in the sense that people had one job. Now women have two jobs, and they're both full time. A lot of men have extra responsibilities too. There's been a lot of role morphing that goes on. So women and men have much more on their plate than we used to. Anyone here know what a sad diet is? Mm -hmm. It stands for Standard American Diet, and what that means is McDonald's, Taco Bell, Burger King, highly processed, ready to eat, quick, easy to get, <coughs> relatively cheap, that is low in nutrient density, high in inflammatory processes, and hard to digest. We're known, like throughout the world, for the sad diet. This is our contribution to the world. <laughs> Studies have shown that when people move to the United States within like three years, they have all the same problems we did compared to when they lived in their native countries. So it's a dubious contribution. <clears throat> We're less active. I always tease my husband. He parks really far from the store. I'm like, but there's a spot right in front. We're really less active. I don't remember the last time I got on a bike. Part of it is in Newton. I'm kind of scared I'm going to be hit by a car. So I don't get on a bike, but I don't remember the last time I biked, walked somewhere. We get less sleep. It's hard for our bodies to rejuvenate when we are stressed. Genetically modified foods. <clears throat> Whose favor is genetically modified foods in? Yours? Or the company that produced them? Yeah, I hear, I hear murmuring, company that produced them. So GMO foods were designed to grow faster, tolerate the transmission from California to Boston better, or be more resistant to pesticides or drought. None of those things are in your favor. It's not tastier. It doesn't have a higher nutrient density or value. It's not easier for your body to digest. <coughs> Let's talk about hybridized foods. Do you know what that is? These are foods, their genes haven't been modified per se, but they've been bred, <coughs> like my pedigree, they've been bred to do certain things. So wheat is a beautiful example of a hybridized food. Uh, whenever you sing the national anthem and it talks about the waving fields, they no longer wave up here. 
They wave down here. Wheat grows to 18 inches high. It grows extremely fast. And the yield compared to what our ancestors had per acre, it's 10 times more per acre than our ancestors had <coughs> 50, 60 years ago. The hybridization of that gene that causes it to grow faster and more, more robust also makes it have a much higher allergenic component. They've amplified the gluten in the, in the bread. So, so you know, out, out of an ounce, it has more gluten in it than it did before they started making it grow faster and be more resistant to pesticides and et cetera. Excuse me? Yes, ma'am. Could you just explain the word hybridized again? Hybridized is a process in which they're breeding it in order to do something specific. So they found there's this gene and it makes it grow faster. Oh, okay. So they amplify it. Oh, okay. Or they, they breed it to do that. It's uh, like Mendel's original experiment, experiments that they put into wheat. <coughs> We're also cleaner. You know, we have eight chickens. I don't know how my husband persuaded me to get chickens, but we got eight chickens. And the kids love to let them run around the yard. And I'm always saying, go wash your hands. God forbid they should get exposed to some dirt, right? They've yet to get any um, chicken-borne diseases, but being cleaner also doesn't allow our immune systems to get these little challenges that allow our immune systems to know what to do. And then we get a big challenge and we really don't know what to do. So being cleaner isn't always necessarily a good thing. It's not so bad to eat without washing your hands, as long as you didn't just hold salmonella or something like that. We're also heavier. Being bigger raises risks for <coughs> heart disease, diabetes, certain uh, fat-related cancers, and this is not in our favor. These, these are all changes that have occurred over the last two, two, two generations. Anyone depressed now? <laughs> <laughs> so, we're gonna, so we've moved, we're now moving from the appetizers <coughs> into the meal. Right? So we're going to talk about each of these, how to decrease stress. We're going to talk about sugar. Sugar is a really nasty actor in our diets and our bodies today. We're going to increase the good glut flora. We're going to talk about that. And talk about inhibiting the bad guys who make you <coughs> suffer. We're going to talk about healing the lining. That's the, that's the separation in the cells, the lining of the cells. And before I forget, um, these slides will be on our YouTube channel, hopefully tomorrow, uh, the stuff saying yes. So our, these slides will be live on the Visions Healthcare YouTube channel as of tomorrow. So you don't have to worry if you miss something, it'll be live. I won't change it between now and then. It'll be exactly what you see. <clears throat> We're going to talk about minimizing repeat exposure and what exposure does to the lining. And talking about family. You can't treat yourself and you can't treat your family. I was sick for 20 years. God, if I could treat myself, I would have figured it out at 23 instead of 35. But most people on average are sick for four years before they're diagnosed, largely because it is really hard to recognize as we evolve that we're no longer amazing, because it evolves slowly. I'm assuming you cannot read this, so I'll read it. You need to go home, take a long, relaxing bath, surrounded by aromatic candles, and do an hour of yoga. Yeah. But that's out of the question. How about a five-minute break? Anybody feel that way ever? You need a lot more time to de-stress, and what you have is time to go to the bathroom and pee. And sometimes people, in my house, people usually come with me when that occurs, so it's not even really formally a de-stress because someone's there. <coughs> it's important to decrease stress. You know, everybody talks about it, but why? Like, what's such, you know, it's good. It gets you out of, gets you out of the way of the oncoming car. It gets you out of the way of the bus. It helps you, it, it actually does increase your quickness of response when you're in the midst of a stressor. So if you're in a game, it's really good. There's two phases of the acute, of the stress response. I cannot do justice to how amazing this process is. So there's two books that I'll recommend. One is called Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers, and it's by a man named Robert Sapolsky. Okay, the guy's a genius, literally a genius. The book is about, I don't know, 300, 400 pages long, and the font is in, like, nine. It took me about two years to decipher this book because it's really, really needy. But it's a wonderful book, and it explains everything about the stress response. And the other is 
Adrenal Fatigue by James Wilson. That's a much more readable book. It's not as, it's not as intricate. So it just depends where you fall on the data, data spectrum. So there's two, two phases of this stress response. One is acute. And in the acute response, your body shuts down digestion because we, although we have amazing technology, are extremely primitive. And what I mean by that is even though like, I got my iPad, I got my computer, I have this cool thing that lets me advance the slides without touching it, we're very primitive. And what we're designed to do is get out of the way of the lion that's chasing us and run away. So in an acute stress response, what will happen is digestion stops. Digestion is considered non-essential when you're in the midst of an acute stressor. And that's all I'll say about essential and non-essential and this, you know, what we've come, what we're into in the government. But in, in an acute stress response, your legs will be much more responsive to insulin and will take up sugar much faster because you need to run. Your body thinks it needs to run. Even though it's just a deadline or your boss or, or your family member, we don't really understand that in our bodies. It's very, very primitive. <coughs> The blood is diverted away from your gut when you have a stressor because, again, it's not essential. You don't need to digest your food. You need to get away. By the way, there's all these bacteria inside you. We'll talk about them. And a lot of them are designed to digest you when you die. And when you stop digesting your food, they have a field day. They think, oh, it's time for me to go to work. And they start digesting your food, except they're not, they're not subject to the rules. And they start making gas, and they start making bloating, and they start making trouble. So we want to avoid the stress response. We want to avoid turning that stress response on on a repeated basis. And if we turn it on, we want to shut it down. In a chronic state, and we're not going to say very much about it because it's extremely complicated, but the bottom line of chronic stress, meaning it's not just you almost get in a car accident and then it's done. It's repeated every day, unending. In a state like that, raises your risk for all comers of issues. Heart disease, diabetes, cancer, stroke, weight gain, and that's where the apple and the, the uh, pear do come into, into play. But it's extremely damaging to our bodies, and that's all I'm going to say about that for now. So the key parts of your body that get involved when there's stress are the <coughs> adrenals, the liver, the brain, and the gut. And has everyone here heard of the sympathetic and parasympathetic reactions? So sympathetic is known as fight or flight, get out of the way, run away. Parasympathetic is rest, relaxation, digestion, restoration. So both of them are important. You actually really do need both of them. But the key is to be able to turn on and off what you need so that your body does what it needs to do in the most efficient manner. So let's do a little exercise. Everybody, find your pulse. There's a bunch of places to find your pulse. I, re I recommend either up here, but don't put both hands here because it'll make you pass out. I know it's bad, but we're not equipped for people passing out in here. I'll put this more. So one side on your pulse, you can find it in your wrist. Avoid your groin in the crown. It's just wrong. Ankle inside of your arm. But this is the easiest as well as the wrist. So as you take a deep breath in, just notice how fast your pulse is going. Now blow, up, take, blow that breath out and notice what your pulse does. I'll give you a minute to just, well not a minute, but I'll give you a couple seconds to do that a few times. What you should notice is that your pulse slows down when you breathe out. And why that's happening is that when you breathe in, you're activating sympathetic, which is fight or flight. And when you breathe out, you're activating parasympathetic, which is rest, relaxation, digestion, restoration. Now, you obviously have to breathe in, right? So I'm not saying don't breathe in. But what I am saying is that you want to focus every day on breathing out for longer than you breathe in. Now, in some circles, this is called meditation. In my patients, when I see them and I say, okay, can you meditate? They go, oh no, I can't do that. I can't sit still. I don't know how to do it. I can't clear my mind. It doesn't really matter, to tell you the truth. What matters is that on a consistent daily basis, you, you focus more on the out-breath because that quiets your adrenals. And we'll, I'll say more about that in a second. So 
The adrenals are these little glands located above your kidneys and your back. And what they do is they pump out cortisol and cortisone, aldosterone. They basically allow you to get out of bed in the morning. And when we're stressed, more cortisol is pumped out because that's what's having the body really know what to do. But in a stressor, uh, in a stressor, you will shut down digestion. So if you're able to cue your body to rest, restore, relax, and digest, your, your digestion will get better. I seem to have destroyed my table here. Mm. All right, so it also includes your response to insulin because when you're in a stressor, your body has, remember, your body has sent more blood flow to your legs. You get insulin resistant in other parts of the body. That includes your gut, all of your other muscles. So it improves your body's response to insulin just by breathing out for longer than breathing in. You know, I love things that are free. This is free. I love things that you can't screw up. You can't screw this up either. You breathe every day. So simply by paying attention to your breath, you can cue your body to quiet itself. You know, that's why people say, take a deep breath. OK, take a deep breath in, but then blow it out. It's free. It also decreases your blood pressure. Free. You don't need a medicine. It doesn't have any side effects. And you can't do it wrong. It also improves your immune function. Chronic stress decreases your immune's ability to function. This is not good, right? Doing something every day. Doesn't matter what you do. So I've listed some things, you know, mindfulness, Tai Chi, Qigong. You don't have to do it a particular way, but what you do have to do is to do it every day. For some people, it's gardening. For other people, it's simply sitting somewhere quietly. TV does not qualify, just FYI. <laughs> I was thinking you could sit somewhere, and then I thought, no, input does not qualify. It's really to quiet the system down. So one of the take-home messages, know your limits. Are you a bull or are you a mouse? There's no harm in being a mouse. Mouses are cute. There's no problem to be someone who really cannot withstand a lot of input. It's good to know that about yourself so that you don't <coughs> overextend yourself. Every day you've got to do something that quiets your animals and supports your body in doing what it needs to do. It really matters. <clears throat> so now we're going to talk about one of my favorite subjects. I learned the coolest things preparing for this talk. It's really creepy and now I'm going to give it all to you so tonight you can think about it too. Let's talk about sugar. Anyone here crave sugar? <laughs> oh, it's a sugar loving crowd. Okay, you may want to stop listening at this point. It's never good news. I love ignorance. Ignorance is bliss, but knowledge is power, and there's a spectrum here. So I'm going to give you the knowledge, and then you might not be able to forget it. Okay, so history of sugar. I, this is so cool. In 1813, so actually 200 years ago, we, our ancestors consumed two pounds of sugar a year. The year I was born, they studied it again and found that people were consuming on average 123 pounds a year. That's like two pounds a week. Now it's up to 153 pounds a year. Now I'm into numbers, so forgive me. Because I was like, well, how much is that per week? That's three pounds a week. That's six cups per week. 42 and a half teaspoons a day. I, that's a lot of coffee, man, you know? Like, that's really just loading it in. Is that real? No kidding! I know I was completely horrified myself. But yes, it's real. I did the, con you know, I was tort. My husband's like, what are you doing? Who cares about the conversions? But I really had to sort of, I actually went downstairs and spooned, a uh, spooned something into this cup and it came to eight ounces. And then I thought, but wait, all substances are not equal. But when I did it, it came out to eight ounces. I was horrified. It's 178 grams a day. And why that matters is the recommended daily allowance for sugar is 40 grams a day. So we're four plus times the average intake as what the government says. I don't know if our government is always right, but they did a lot of work to figure this out. Then I was even more curious because I'm always interested in knowing, like, well, what am I actually eating? How much sugar is that? So here it is. 
three quarters of a cup of grapes has 20. So if you eat three quarters of a cup of grapes, you're halfway there to your recommended daily allowance. Apple, banana, strawberries. I'm always teasing my husband. They came from <coughs> Russia and they didn't have fresh fruit in Russia. It was like completely barren. So they come to America and they, are, they eat fruit like nobody's business. But it's really high in sugar. And so I'm always teasing him like there's a lot of sugar in that. And we don't even think about it. Listen, apples are good. Don't stop eating them. It's apple season. But it's a lot of sugar. The berries really do have less sugar in them. A cup of whole strawberries has about 7 grams compared to the grapes, which is 20 grams. <coughs> Veggies. Veggies have between 0 and 9 grams. The beets are up at 9 grams per cup. Brussels sprouts, which we had last night, are 0. You know, sort of reminiscent of the points program from Weight Watchers where you could eat. The, the Brussels sprouts are free. Have whatever you want. They don't mess with your blood sugar. Of note, the cruciferous vegetables, of which Brussels sprouts is one, or otherwise known as brassica, directly decrease your risk of cancers and in some cases can help heal dysplasia, dysplastic cells. So your mom was right when she said eat your broccoli. She's totally right. Now, one thing that I will say is that <clears throat> the RDA is, I think, five to seven servings a day. And we think, great, I'll have five servings of fruit and one or two servings of vegetable, and I'll have eight by five, right? We think about how much fruit we can have. But in reality, it's probably flipped the other way, that what you want to be focusing on are the vegetables and try to get five servings of those and one or two of the fruits, sort of flipping everything on its head when you're looking at sugar. Because if you're eating, you could eat, you could eat five servings of berries and not surpass the RDA for sugar. Now, by the way, this doesn't even count the bread, the cake, the cookie, the candy, the pasta. This is only straight up food. So that's why I'm sort of hammering this, because if you want to eat, the bread, the cake, the candy, the cookie, the pasta. You can't have all the fruit. Although I would probably vote have the fruit and don't have the fixings, but candy. Um, you know, it's Halloween. We have to talk about candy. So a Hershey's bar, I, I don't know how big that is. But what I do know is I bought our Halloween candy and I brought it in because I thought, all right, it's perfect. Okay. I'll show you how big this is. So three of these has 24 grams of sugar. So one of these has 8 grams of sugar. Three of these has 26 grams of sugar. That was the serving size they gave on the package. Two Reese's peanut butter cups, 21 grams of sugar. And a Snickers bar, gram for gram, is more than half sugar. It's crazy. When they said it really satisfied, I think they meant your sweet tooth. <laughs> All right, so here's the bad news. If you weren't already depressed enough, here's the real bad news. I don't know a single human being who wants to store more fat. I mean, I don't know, maybe, but most women, and I don't treat men, so I'm sorry if I pick on women, but I generally only see women. So what happens in your body? You eat the sugar, your liver stores it as something called glycogen, which is a long chain of sugar molecules hooked together, gets stored in your liver, which is right here. And when you need it, your liver re releases it. But now, the RDA has occurred, and you're way surpassed it. You store it as fat. So if you eat too much sugar, it gets stored as fat. I don't know anybody who wants to do that. So this is where the bad news comes in, that it does, it does really matter, because what goes into your body stays a lot of times. Let's talk about my favorite organ. I know this sounds weird, but it not really runs your body. <clears throat> I was talking to a psychiatrist and I said to him, come on, 80% of your body's serotonin is produced here, not here. Serotonin is the happy hormone, the, the, what make, you know, everybody's taking selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors so that they have more serotonin. Guess what? Your gut produces 80% of it and if your gut is having a bad day, you might be too. Your gut is made up, if, you know, scientists don't have enough to do sometimes. So somebody took the gut and spread it, those single layers thin over, they spread it out, and it would cover the size of a tennis court. So that's how many cells are in your gut, just lining the gut. And it is one cell thick. So really very little stands between you and mayhem because your gut is doing all of the work that everything you're exposed to on a daily basis to process it properly and make sure that you're safe. It's really complicated in there. 
All right, anyone been to New York? All right, so I see my kids raising their hand in the back. <coughs> so um, there are some scientists who think that what's in your gut is a symbiotic community. And there's them and there's us. And they're inside us doing all kinds of things to keep us alive. And it, it, it makes sense, although it's really creepy to think about. It is like a miniature city in there. This is really creepy. There are, for every cell in your body, there are 10 bacteria. They outnumber us by 10 to 1. It's terrible. I mean, it's probably good, because when they're doing their job, we feel like a million bucks. But if we're not, we feel terrible. This means 1 to 3 trillion organisms. <clears throat> a lot in there. <coughs> Excuse me. It weighs 3 to 5 pounds. You're carrying around 3 to 5 pounds of things inside of you. There's lots of, lots of different organisms make that up. Yeast, bacteria, the bacteria can be good for you, it can be bad for you, or it can be indeterminate, meaning it's okay until it overgrows and then it's pathogenic. So let's talk about the gut. Uh, anyone here ever had antibiotics? <laughs> right? The antibiotic nation. So, uh, antibiotics are great because they've kept us alive. And if you have strep throat and you take antibiotics, of course you're going to need that or you're going to get lockjaw, right? So, antibiotics, when we take them, we're not really always thinking about where it's going. So it goes in your mouth, goes to your stomach, goes to your intestine, and then goes to its direct place where it needs to be working. But along the way, those antibiotics are killing off all of the good guys in your gut who are working to digest your food properly and protect you. They finally make it to the end organ of your throat or your arm or wherever that is. But along the way, they are, they are throwing out of balance that which is there to digest your food, keep you protected. So I was born, I think I mentioned this in 1970, there were no discussions about probiotics. Right? Probiotics have been very popular in the last few years, but not now. Oh, I'm sorry, not then. And when I was six months old, I was lying on my dad's chest quietly. And my mom and dad said, oh, she's so cute, look at her lying there quietly. And then they said, six-month-olds don't lie there quietly on their father's chests. I had pneumonia. So I got antibiotics. But in 1970, there were not probiotic discussions. So you can imagine repeated antibiotic exposure is very, very <coughs> difficult for people to deal with without then replenishing what's in the gut. <coughs> Excuse me. So, we, I mentioned probiotics. There's probiotics, there's the lactobacillus, the bifidum, there's a bunch of different strains. And then there's prebiotics. Prebiotics preferentially feed the good guys in your gut. Probiotics do feed all comers, meaning a probiotic could feed someone who's a little bit pathogenic, and it could also serve to replenish the good bacteria. Probiotics can be shelf-stable. It's really hard to travel. I had a guy from Portugal in my last talk. I said, it's really hard to go to Portugal and be traveling around if you need to have a refrigerated form of probiotics. They can be shelf-stable, but I do not recommend that you take a chewable one because it's full of sugar. So you want the ones that you have to actually swallow. Um, I mean, yogurt has it now. Fermented foods are naturally high in probiotics. So there's lots of ways to get them. And the goal is 15 to 20 live cells per, excuse me, live cells per day. And you really can't harm yourself with probiotics. So you don't have to worry, oh, is it 15 to 20? Did I take too much? Don't worry about it. Take more. Someone asked me in my last talk, what happens if you take antibiotics? I would recommend you bump it up. So take it two to three times a day instead of once. And then the next question was, do you take the same brand forever? No, you should switch it up. Every three, six, nine months, change brands so that you're getting different strands, so that you are really repopulating your gut. It's like a rotation, you know, after five years, you start again on the old one. <coughs> These are some, this is not complete, these are some things that are found in your gut. You know, the shigella should not be there. But a lot of these things, E. coli lives in us, and it's okay, as long as it doesn't grow too much. The goal is balance and figuring out where's your line. 
there's actually ways, to, I'm going to go back to this, there's ways that you can test for what's growing in there. Um, anybody have a sense of how you test for what's growing in your gut? Breath test. You can do a breath test, yeah. you can do a stool <coughs> test. Most people, when I say stool test, they're like, really? But you get good information to so actually see what's growing down there. Let's talk about candida. Anyone heard of candida? ICD-9 code 112, there's a bunch of code, you know, there's a bunch of options for that, but it's not inhibited or killed off when you take an antibiotic. An antibiotic is for bacteria. When you take an antibiotic, candida have a field day because all of the plants around them that were inhibiting their unopposed growth are now gone. Because you took the antibiotic, it killed off all the good guys. Now yeast says, woohoo, I can grow. It's like a garden without plantings. The, th the weeds grow. It often masquerades as something else. And what do I mean by that? I mean that people who have an overgrowth of candida in their gut, this is not complete. This is, this is like first, this is all I could fit on the slide. And then I figured I would make you run f screaming from the room if I kept going. So this is not a complete list, but heavy, painful periods, Difficult menopause, water retention, weight gain, bloating, gas, diarrhea, constipation. It's not a pretty list. <clears throat> I always think of the candida like gremlins. Anyone here seen the movie Gremlins? They're okay until they overgrow and then they really misbehave. The good, the bad, and the downright depressing. The good news is candida is treatable. It's completely treatable. It's not going to kill you. It's just going to make you suffer until you treat it. Bad news. Any, who here likes to wait? Anyone really into waiting? I, I'm so crazy that by when I get to the checkout counter, my husband and I split up so that you know one of us will get in a faster lane. But no, truthfully, if we take all of the kids shopping, by that time we really need to get out of the store before we're asked to leave. So we want to get out of there quickly. But nobody likes to wait. This is the origin of fast food. It's, you know, buffets. It's immediately ready. Nobody likes to wait. I completely get that. But treating candida takes a while, as does healing the lining of the gut. And the reason it takes a while is you didn't get that way overnight, and it's not going to get better overnight. And typically it takes 6 to 12 months to really treat it. And then what's really depressing is that once you have been someone who has a, a candida overgrowth, you are someone who's at risk for it coming back if you this is not a diet. Let's say a minute about diet versus lifestyle change. In a diet, it implies temporary. So you want to lose 10 pounds for someone's wedding, you go on a diet. You want to get healthy, you change your life. So the treatment of candida is not a diet, it's a lifestyle change. You know, you know, usually my patients, when I tell them that, they're like, really? Does that mean I can never have cake at my son's wedding or whatever? No, you can have it. But the key is moderation. and. Going back to the rain barrel, your rain barrel is different than your neighbor's, so you might be able to tolerate one excursion <clears throat> per month, while your friend can only tolerate it once every six months. So let's talk about how to heal the lining of the gut. This is another painfully slow problem. I'm sorry to be so depressing, by the way. You know, I'm just thinking there's nothing I've said that's happy. I'm sorry in advance, but you'll feel better if you do it. <coughs> It is an extremely slow process. You have to take away the irritant. So, you know, most of this room is gluten-free. You've already done half the work because gluten is extremely challenging to the lining of the gut. So if you take that away, you're no longer irritating the lining. Reducing stress, because we talked about needing to adequately digest your food. And if your digestion is inhibited, it's not balanced in there. You really need to digest your food and you need to be Stress less to do that. <coughs> Anyone here heard of a rotation diet? One. Anyone here done a rotation diet? No. It's really, oh, you've done it? It's really hard to do. God love you. What it means, well, actually, I'll talk about that in a minute. Rotation diet also helps heal the lining of the gut, and I'll talk about it why in a second. Getting enough sleep. Your body fixes itself when you sleep. So you need to sleep enough. <coughs> typically you need six to eight hours of sleep. Some people need more and some people uh, typically don't need less. But some people say to me, yep, four hours of sleep a night and they're great. <coughs> My fan club came back. <laughs> you 
sufficient nutrients. You know, if your gut is challenged, you really need to give it the things it needs to quiet down. And avoiding processed foods, I, I, I didn't, I, I'll admit, Stephanie's here now, she helps me with all things technological, but I didn't know how to put the YouTube video in, so I'm sorry. But this is a really great video. It looks at ramen noodles digestion. So, oh, you've seen it. It's horrifying, right? They take Gatorade and ramen noodles and they put it in someone and they actually got someone to swallow a camera that looked at how the noodles were digesting. And then they had some other drink and homemade noodles. Now, disclaimer, they're both gluten and we as human beings do not digest gluten. It is indigestible. However, they looked at simply the difference between the processed food and the homemade food, how it digested. It was so cool. It's about three or five minutes long. It's worth watching. This is not a complete list. And there, the slides will be live. You don't have to worry about taking it down. This is a start of a list of products that help heal the lining of the gut. Probiotics help. L-glutamine helps. Arabinogalactians, which are the prebiotics. There's, uh, chamomile is on this list. Interestingly, chamomile, I think a lot of people think of as a very boring substance. You know, oh, it's just chamomile. But it is considered a bitter, and it does it help heal the lining of the gut, surprisingly. But also can aid with digestion. <clears throat> By the way, I think I mentioned don't do this on your own. You really do need professional support. Um, it's hard to treat yourself. <coughs> have someone support you, do not, it's a total waste of money to, to take all these things but fail to remove the irritants in your, in your gut, in your diet. So I definitely recommend that you see someone. We have the providers from Visions Healthcare, you can talk to them, you can come for a consult, but don't do this alone. It's too hard. And it's also a really big waste of money to take all of these all at once. That's like 30, 40 pills three times a day, it's not worth it. So I mentioned rotation diet, a couple people have heard about it. What it means is that you can eat something, and you can probably eat it, you know, that's within a 24-hour period again, but generally you avoid eating the same food more than once or twice within a four-day period. These are really hard programs to be on because we are creatures of habit. I don't know, do you eat the same thing for breakfast every day? I say to patients, what do you eat? She says, every day I have a cup of oatmeal with this, this, and this. We are creatures of habit, and that's really good to make sure you bring along your ID and don't forget it and bring along your keys, but it's really good for <coughs> your gut because your gut on a daily basis is getting exposed to the same, same things. things. And if those things are getting through the lining into your bloodstream every day, your body's being challenged. And this is how <coughs> multiple food sensitivities, chemical <coughs> sensitivities, this is how it develops, being challenged on a daily basis. Rotation diets are hard to do. I definitely recommend a nutritionist support. You're saying no? They're not hard. They're not hard. Mm -hmm. I don't know. When my doctor said do a rotation diet, I was like, you have to be careful. It has, if you set it up right, it's not hard. All right. So I, I are you a nutritionist better. by any chance? No, but I, I'm a nurse, and I, I, they did that blood sputum urine testing. The company that does it, they send back all, everything that you're A and B antibodies to. Yep. And they send you the rotation diet and what you can eat. That's very nice. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So what I usually recommend is people go to the nutrition <coughs> three weeks before you, so you're on a plan. The next thing is to minimize repeat exposure. Why? You know, if you're gluten sensitive, and we've talked about the lining of your gut that has these, these separations and the zonulin and the, you know, there's a lot of stuff to manage, but essentially, it's been shown that it can take up to three months for your gut to heal when you are gluten sensitive and exposed on one exposure. So people with celiac walking around, you're exposed to gluten once, and it can take three months to heal, which may be one reason if you, you know, if you eat out a lot and they're not as careful with your food as maybe you need them to be, while well, you never quite heal if you're yet at a million bucks because your gut is still being challenged and the lining is still being um, challenged. I was going to say abused, but that's just a terrible, it's just still really hard to heal the lining. <clears throat> How much exposure? I got this question in the last one. Someone said to me, I don't know, I don't feel it. How much is too much? And I would say the problem is we don't know. You don't know if you're having cross-contamination and you know, if you're having cross-contamination and you notice it, then that's too much. But if you don't notice it, I don't know the answer. We don't know the answer. You have to do an endoscopy after eating. 
and do it on a regular basis. And we just don't have any volunteers yet to do those studies. <laughs> so. so back to why minimizing exposure helps. Damaging the lining decreases your ability to absorb your nutrients. You know, when I was 15, I was anemic, and my doctor did this really expensive workup. It just didn't include the celiac workup. Took iron, didn't help. Only years later did I realize, oh, I was an early celiac. <coughs> But it wasn't popular then, so nobody tested for that. <coughs> so again, you, what we're really looking to do is decrease zonulin production, which is increase in people who have celiac disease and eat gluten. So if you're not eating gluten, you're not triggering zonulins. You don't have to you know, worry as much about that. But if you're having exposure to gluten, you're producing the zonulins, they're, they're opening up these linings, and your bloodstream is exposed to it. When I first saw this slide, I thought, oh, lots of amoebas, but it's actually a tree. It's right here. And this is what it's like to treat yourself. It's really hard to treat yourself, right? It's really, so my kids are here, and you know, I try not to embarrass them, but our, uh, all of our kids inherited at least one gluten gene from me. And our older two got gluten out of the house. After I was diagnosed, we went gluten-free in the house, but they would still get it at preschool. And, um, it took us a really long time to figure out that our oldest and our second were sensitive to gluten. And it was one night we went out to dinner and they had some of my uh, relatives' rice that had a gravy on it. And by the time we came home, they were both very little at the time. They were on the toilet together, both having diarrhea. And we, my husband and I went, oh, our kids are allergic. We, hadn't, we had not penetrated. It's very difficult to treat yourself and your family. <coughs> so I always recommend having an outside impartial person who can say, Oh, yeah. I mean, we happen to ha happen on it, but really, it's really hard to do for yourself. What are you testing for? Tissue transglutaminase. Very, very cheap test. 70 bucks, depending on the lab. That looks at whether you actually have the autoimmune disease, celiac disease. It does not tell you whether you are sensitive to gluten. Okay? There's a threshold that you have to cross that's considered autoimmune. So this is sort of a fine point because people will say, well, should we wait to get celiac before we go gluten-free? My vote is no, because you're going to be suffering. But it sometimes can help people determine where to go next. Test your family and yourself for DQ2 and DQ8. If you are negative, your chance of developing celiac is practically zero. It's not zero, but it's practically zero. I alluded to methyl tetrahydrofolate reductase. This is the gene that raises your risk for, for death from all causes. Heart disease, stroke, cancer, anxiety, depression. It's implicated in just about everything. So it's not related to celiac, but it is related to how you process B12 and folate. So now, if you imagine, you, can't, you have DQ2 and DQ8, you have celiac disease, and you're not even absorbing your nutrients. Whatever you absorb, if you're positive for the methyl tetrahydrofolate reductase gene, you're now not utilizing what you have absorbed. So it's a really bad combination. Yes, ma'am. Um, is this a special genealogical test? No, it's a blood test. Okay. So there's a uh, company called Spectracell that's offering a, I'm not paid by them. They're, they're offering a special now. It's like $35 to get yourself tested. And then there's uh, LabCorp does it. That's $618. And if you have a $500 deductible, you get a bill for like $118. People have been really mad at us because we didn't realize that. Um, but it is just a straight up blood test. Why, if this is so prevalent, why, do you, uh, why does mainstream medicine not cover this all the time? So the question is, if this is mainstream medicine, why, does, why is it not covered all the time? Part of it, well, this, the LabCorp test is covered. It's just that you have, if you have a deductible, you have to fulfill that first. But I think partly the methyl tetrahydrofolate reductase <coughs> is really cutting edge medicine. This, this is the forefront. People are just starting to have full data about it, and even what we have. In, in five years, we'll look back and go, God, it was the dark ages for MTHFR. This is really evolving science. What do you do with it? What do you do with it? So the question is, what do you do with it? If you're positive for one or two of these mutations, you make sure that when you take a vitamin, you're taking the activated form of B12 and folate, because if you have one gene, your ability to process B12 and folate is impaired by uh, 40 to 60 percent, and if you have two genes, it can be impaired by up to 90 percent, which means, you know, you're, you're such a good doobie, you take your multivitamin, and you basically pee it out, because you can't absorb it, you can't convert it to its active form. All right, uh, let me, one sec, I'll come back to that in a sec. 
It's important for children to intervene early. Anyone in the audience who has children who are pre-adolescent, children who have celiac disease and are not diagnosed before puberty will continue to have short stature growth delay, delayed puberty. It's very important to diagnose these children because they won't reach their full height. They won't, it, it messes with their ability to function. What we've talked about is a lot of work. It's months of work. Being gluten-free makes you already halfway there because you remove the major irritant in your system. And, you know, I always want to say to people, you can do this. You can totally do this. Don't do it alone. Definitely have support and help. But you can do this. Thank you. I said I would come back to your question. So the so the the question is whether DQ2 and DQ8 is celiac related, and the answer is yes. So if you were a carrier, I mean, I have a child who has celiac. Is that related to the gluten intolerance? Yes. Yeah. 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 You know, in my case, I got one from both my parents, so, because they're each a carrier, and I got one, and by the way, the risk of celiac with two genes is like one in ten, so, you know, being strong like mouse and doing OBGYN and two genes, bad combination. <laughs> Sorry, question? Can you just quickly mention some of the autoimmune diseases that, that can result from having these problems? Rheumatoid arthritis, type 1 diabetes. I've had a complete and total brain fart. Sorry? Eczema. And totally, eczema. But although, like, straight up autoimmune, like, Fibre when you look at autoimmune. What am I missing? Fibromyalgia. Fibromyalgia. So these are, so there's autoimmune, which means your immune system is all riled up, lupus. And then there's medical issues. That includes the psoriasis, the eczema, the asthma. Um, thinning hair randomly is related to candida, randomly. Other questions? Yes, ma'am. Is there any um, research to show that really early diagnosis will thwart off the additional autoimmune that you can sort of be open to? Or so the question is whether early diagnosis really matters? Yeah, basically. Yeah. So if you're... Studies have shown if you delay introduction of gluten into a diet, that you will delay the onset of celiac, basically by whatever time period that was that you didn't have gluten in the diet. And so <coughs> you're not necessarily delaying onset except by the period of time that you didn't expose someone. It's right. a little confusing. So my son was diagnosed at 13 months, so he's only eating gluten for a few months. So there's a big army that's hoping that since he only ate gluten for four months, will he be less likely to develop the other Yes, yes. Absolutely. absolutely. When you remove gluten, this is one of the only, this is an amazing autoimmune disease because when you remove gluten, you remove the source of the problem. You still have to heal his gut. You still have to make sure you manage his stress and improve his digestion and all that. But, yes, absolutely. He should have puberty at the same age as his friends and be the same size. Yes. You also can reverse all these autoimmune things yes. by decreasing gluten. Yes. Completely. Question. I just heard several people say that they were diagnosed as having a problem with gluten, and I'm wondering if things changed that much, or did I go to the wrong hospital? Because I remember when I went and had to get tested, they said, no, 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 you're not allergic to this, either. You, you have no problem. And I said, really? And then my, my doctor actually said to me, you know, if it, if it walks like a duck, it talks like a duck, guess what? It's a duck. <laughs> because the minute I stopped eating the gluten, I started feeling better. But so, uh, are there better tests or better doctors? Or <laughs> uh, far be it from me to talk about the doctor. <laughs> but there's a spectrum. I only went two or three years ago, and I said, "Oh no, you're gonna it. You're on the spectrum, so you may not have florid celiac disease, but what you have is probably <coughs> a genetic probability along with the sensitivity, and you just haven't made it that last part of the immune part. So happy for you, because I wouldn't wish celiac on my worst enemy, truthfully. It's a hard thing to dance with. So I think it's great that you were diagnosed before, but it's hard. You don't have a formal diagnosis, but you feel better. Oh, yeah. Yeah. There was a question here. Yes. Yeah. 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 Ye
Could you speak um, briefly about the, the connection between <clears throat> infertility, miscarriages, stillbirths, and celiac disease? The question is if I can speak about the connection between infertility, miscarriages, and stillbirth on, on celiac, with celiac disease. And what I think the connection is is inflammation and that the body <coughs> just cannot sustain it. Um, interestingly, I have a lot of patients who come in and they're trying to get pregnant and to a team, we say, you know what, you need to go gluten-free and dairy-free. If you want to be pregnant, you've got to take the top two inflammatory allergens out of your diet. Because even if you don't have celiac, there's an inflammatory process with those foods. Uh, but women who have celiac are, actually, infertility is an indication to check for celiac. Because so many, there's such a high prevalence. Yes, ma'am. I was like you, when I got diagnosed, it was like 35. Does that mean, was I, were we always celiac and just didn't get diagnosed, or? So the question is, how long were you celiac before you were diagnosed? How long did you have symptoms? I mean, I remember being 20, 23, and I was in my pre-medical school job, and I, I was like, I had really bad gas. And I just thought everyone was better able to hold it in. <laughs> I'm sure I had celiac at that point, I just wasn't diagnosed. So the question is, how long did you have symptoms for? That's how long you were sick for. I was sick when I was a teenager. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, but that was me. So can you have some of the minor symptoms? Like the, the yeah. real stomach issues didn't come out till mm -hmm. a few years before I was diagnosed, but I guess... Most people don't have stomach issues. Yeah. They have other issues. Anemia, yeah. osteoporosis. You know you have a patient mm -hmm. with osteoporosis. My dad broke his hip when he was 50. Rollerblading. 50-year-old <coughs> men do not break their hips. Um, Right? Men. He's a guy. What is he? Nobody tested him for celiac until a few years later, but he had celiac disease. Osteoporosis is an indicator. A lot of people have non-GI manifestations. So that's why I say, you know, get your family tested because it's not always, it doesn't always look as clear as gas, bloating, diarrhea, constipation. There's other stuff. There was another question. Sir. Could you explain again, please, the difference between probiotics and prebiotics? Definitely. So the question is, what's the difference between probiotics and prebiotics? Probiotics are the fully finished form. Those are um, uh, bacillus, lactobacillus, bifidum. They're a particular strain. <clears throat> prebiotics are arabinogalactans, and it is food that helps the probiotics develop. It's like fish food. <laughs> Other questions? Yes. Could you talk a little bit more about the eczema or psoriasis connection? Yeah, you know, uh, the question is, can I talk a little more about the eczema psoriasis connection? You know what, here's the thing, your body's a barometer for what's going on, and the skin is a beautiful <coughs> barometer. And when your gut lining is impaired, it's allowing things through. When there's candida, when there's gluten, gluten, dairy, and candida, to me, are the top three issues that, uh, that cause skin things. Uh, I mean, diabetes, I can never say it properly, DH is associated with celiac across the board. So the skin's a really good barometer. I'm sorry for the guys in the audience. The vagina's a really good barometer. Women come in, they say, oh, I just have yeast infections all the time. That's a gut that's out of balance. So the skin rashes, acne, even acne, not just eczema and psoriasis, but all of these things. And psoriasis is an autoimmune component to it. So. The, this is just saying your, your gut's inflamed, your gut's not functioning properly, and let's 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 look at it. Yes, yes, just real quick to that point. So you're better off speaking to someone who's GI nutrition for that first before you head off to a dermatologist. Or you're better off. Uh, the question is yeah. who you're supposed to yeah. see when you have that. <laughs> Uh, a good one, it doesn't matter what it is. Yeah, right, so I'm sort of, I, I, so what I'm saying is you want to see a physician who believes in treating the entire body, who loves the gut. Um, it's, this is what we do, I can't say that it's what everyone does. So you want to see a doctor who's not just going to say to you, oh, take this. You know, I have a girlfriend who's starting, who started um, <coughs> her skin, I'm blanking on the name, it's really a nasty, it's retinoic acid, it's retin -A. Yeah. Sorry, I'm blanking, but she's taking this nasty medicine for acne, and I was like, come to see one of our doctors, please, we can fix this problem, because it starts from within. So thank you all for your attention, really. Thank you.